we're on a trip. Now, I'm sure you guys are world travelers and you done looked at the map and you know exactly where you are. When, when I go somewhere, I'm usually lost. Uh, so right here we are in North Carolina. But to give you just an, a thumbnail uh, sketch of agriculture in the U.S., uh, basically from Virginia down through about this area, that's the southeastern U.S. we call it, uh, pretty very very diversified agriculture. A lot of row crops, the grains, cotton, uh, peanuts, fair amount of livestock, particularly poultry, and in North Carolina there's a lot of swine, uh, a lot of vegetable crops, so it's a very diverse uh, you get into the Mid-South, which is basically the lower end of Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, that's called the Mid-South. Again, grains, corn, soybeans, uh, cotton, rice is the big ones through there. And then uh, I know one of you said you'd worked in California, so you know that's an extremely diversified, all kinds of crops. North North Carolina, uh, you're sitting right in there right now, and I use this to make the point. North Carolina is geographically pretty diverse, and you get to the east of that line, it's the coastal plain, it's, it's pretty much level land, sandy loam, loamy sand kinds of soils. You mentioned that you went down to the Blacklands uh, on a trip yesterday, and so you were somewhere there in Washington County. But that whole peninsula that sticks out there is typically fairly high organic soils, drain swamps, a lot of grain production in that area. There's also a fair amount of cotton production in that area. Uh, this middle part of the state is kind of what you see when you look out the window here. Rolling hills, red clay, uh, a lot of urban development. In fact, North Carolina is now considered an urban state. But a lot of urban development through there, but still a fair amount of agriculture. Uh, row crops, a uh, little bit of tobacco, uh, some cotton down in this general area down here. And then the mountains is specialty crops. Vegetable crops, burley tobacco, and a few things like that. Give you just a quick overview of what we grow and the significance of it in North Carolina. There are 50 states in the U.S. and we rank number 10 in terms of, of uh, sales of uh, agricultural products. Uh, of course, California is the big one, but we have $12 uh, billion sales per year. We like to think the world revolves around crops in my part of the world, but it don't in North Carolina. This is the uh, cash receipts, and you'll notice that the livestock industry is almost twice as big as the crops industry in this state. Uh, broilers are a big thing. We're I think number two or number three in the country growing broiler, broilers. Uh, there's chicken houses everywhere. Hogs, I guess we're second probably to Iowa on producing hogs. That's a big, big industry. Uh, in terms of crops, the value, tobacco's number one in North Carolina. Uh, soybeans comes in number two, uh, cotton. Uh, about 4% of the gross sales in North Carolina. The thing that a lot of us often don't think about is this so-called green industry. Uh, ornamentals and et cetera, that's a big industry in North Carolina. Acreage that we grow, or y'all may think in hectares, so I put that in there for you, but uh, in terms of the uh, volume of land, soybeans is our number one crop. Cotton, we're growing uh, 465,000 acres. And that varies a little bit from year to year. All right, what y'all really came to talk about was resistance. And I don't really want to lecture to you, I want to talk. So y'all, y'all, any of you, ask questions, speak up, whatever. Do y'all have a problem with the resistance right now? We're seeing, seeing signs of it starting, so that's why yeah, we've come over. Okay. We're seeing it in yeah, ryegrass. Ryegrass, y'all are famous for your ryegrass. Yeah. Barnyard grass. Yeah. 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 Okay. This is uh, one of the first fields that we found Palmer amaranth. It's a pigweed species. One of the first fields in North Carolina we found it in. And actually, there was a crop underneath that stuff. Now, that had been treated three or four times with Roundup when we got there. Obviously, it didn't get that bad overnight. And you talked to enough of the growers in the area where we first found it, and it had been there two or three years before anybody realized something ain't right here. 
and you talk to those guys and, well, I sprayed it. Ah, it was just a bad day. It got washed off. It was dry, you know, didn't realize it. But we found it or verified it in uh, 2005. It's probably been there at least three years prior to that. So you do the math on it. When did we start using Roundup Ready crops and how long did it take to get there? About five or six years and we got there. Y'all know this gentleman? That's Dr. Stephen Powell's, University of Western Australia, the resistance guru in the world. And particularly when it comes to biology and genetics of resistance, he's the man. All right, this is a little bit of an overview of where we are, have been in North Carolina. And I think if you, you listen up, there's a story to be told here. The first problem we had with resistance was goose grass, an annual grass resistant to the dinitroanilins. That's things like trifluralin and pendimethalin. Picked it up back in the early 70s. Where was it? It was in the southern part of the state in two or three counties that were traditionally cotton monoculture. Based on the type of land, they can make more money on cotton than anything else on that really light sandy land. So those cotton fields had been cotton as far back as the old folks could remember. So it had had, you know, a decade of trifluralin and pendimethalin, and all of a sudden it quit controlling them. Uh, triazine resistance in the U.S. is a big issue. In North Carolina, it's not. We picked up some in, in 1980 in the mountains, and it was in river bottoms where they had grown, it was dairymen, and they were growing continuous corn for silage. And that's the only place we think we've got it. This one was a biggie. Uh, our ryegrass is a different uh, species than yours, but otherwise pretty similar. Uh, I'll come back and talk a little bit about it later, but when we got resistance to what we call the ACCase inhibitors, and I'm gonna try to use common names, because I expect y'all got different trade names over there, but this was Diclofop, or for us it was Holon. That was a major development for us. Uh, the cuckleburr resistant to arsenicals happened in the same place we got the goosegrass, that continuous cotton, people spraying the MSMA year after year. A uh, couple of things here that are primarily on, uh, excuse me, right here, golf courses, bluegrass, resistant to a couple of things. Horseweed, I'll come back and talk about it. This one is the biggie for us, and then a few others. But in terms of really being a problem, the ones that we've had the most trouble with has been the ryegrass, the horseweed, or mare's tail. Oh, I, do y'all have that critter? Coniza's the genus? Horsetail? Horsetail, maybe? Horsetail. Maybe, I, I'll show you a picture of it later. That's a fairly big issue. Of course, the ryegrass is a big issue, and this is the one that has just turned us on our head. <coughs> All right, a couple of comments since y'all thinking about uh, I don't have a big problem yet and what can I do about it. Well, I, I do a little teaching to some classes and uh, I hope you ladies don't evaluate me the way my students do, but I thought it made a very good analogy. <laughs> this past year in class I said, to make the point, if you understand a problem, you know how to avoid it. I said, folks, resistance is kind of like pregnancy. If you know what causes it, you might could avoid it. <laughs> I got my evaluation at the end of the year, and one little gal tore me apart. <laughs> so the point of it is, if you know how to avoid a problem, maybe you can avoid it. And so I tell those kids there are two prerequisites for resistance to take place. One of them is you got to have at least one plant somewhere on that farm that carries the genetics that lets it be resistant to a particular herbicide. And the second prerequisite is I've got to put selection pressure on that resistant individual. I've got to kill the rest of them and not kill him and let him reproduce. And you have no way of knowing that until you already got a problem. And so if you're going to try to do anything to head off resistance, then everything you do has to be focused on reducing selection pressure. Management things I can do to cut back on the selection pressure. And some general things, and we'll talk specific on what we're doing in cotton in a moment.
some general things. Basically to reduce selection pressure. We say minimize the seed bank. And I've been around long enough, I've seen a lot of things kind of change. Uh, we went through a period where we got in big time into talking about thresholds, economic thresholds for weeds. It never really caught on with growers like it did with insects. Um, frankly, in most cases, it was an obvious thing. I got enough to treat or I don't have enough to treat. There weren't many of those places kind of where you didn't, you weren't real sure. But the idea of the thing was, well, you know, I, I don't have enough weeds to justify the cost of the thing, so I ain't going to treat. But what impact does that have on the seed bank? I don't treat this year, maybe I saved a few dollars, is it going to cost me more on down the road? Since this resistance thing has come out, you don't hear nobody in this country even say economic thresholds for weeds because we don't want anything going to seed. The one that's going to seed could be the resistant one. And so we're talking about minimizing the seed bank. You minimize, you got fewer weeds out there, you're using less chemical and a whole lot less are being exposed to selection pressure. We have learned the hard way we can't depend on a single herbicide or single mode of action. Y'all guys don't shave any rates when you're using stuff, do you? No. Y'all don't ever shave no rates. <laughs> we need to be thinking about using full rates. Now why? What's using a full rate got to do with resistance management? Well, it's just like people. If there's a cold bug comes in that door there, some of you are going to catch it, some of you are not. There's varying levels of susceptibility in the population. It's the same thing with weeds. And so if I've got, if I'm cutting the rate, uh, what I'm basically doing then is I'm taking out the more susceptible ones and I'm leaving the ones that are a little bit more tolerant and over time it just keeps creeping up on me. So we need to talk about using full rates and that was one of the things that caught us with Roundup. It used to be bragging rights to say, oh I only put 13 ounces of Roundup or whatever. This one is very important here. We need what we call overlapping spectrums of control. And what that in essence means, I'm putting out two herbicides to control the same thing. Now why am I doing that? All right, there's been a lot of computer models put out to, to predict how quick resistance will develop. And let's just say if you're depending on one herbicide over and over, let's just say it's going to develop in five years. On the other hand, if I'm using a mixture of two things, I may put it off 30 or 40 years. The whole idea here is if I'm using two things, but they got the same spectrum of control, they both control the same weed, if I have one in a million that's resistant to this herbicide, this other one's still going to get him. We are, and I'll, I'll talk particularly on cotton in a little bit later, but we're going back strong now using these herbicides we quit using and uh, switching up our chemistry and other crops as much as possible. The other thing that has, uh, sometimes we don't always think about it, but has something to do with the resistance management and that is timeliness of post applications. What's that got to do with resistance? Same thing as cutting rates. If the right size to treat is that big, but I treat that big, Am I not putting a sublethal rate? Am I not taking out the more sensitive ones and leaving the more tolerant ones in the population? So in the case of this Palmer amaranth, just about every post herbicide we got says four inches or less to treat it. Well, it grows two inches a day. And so we, we've 